once again, good morning. morning. We will uh, get you pumped up and turn you loose back outside in that hot air in a few moments. (laughs) We are... uh, Week three of a series that we're called Loving Large. The reason why we call it Loving Large is there's a scripture that I'm going to read to you, which is actually a prayer that basically says God's love is too large to actually contain. And so we're doing this series called Loving Large, and this is week three. We're going to wrap this up last week. And I want to tell you what I told the earlier service this morning, and, and that's this. You know, uh, whenever we, we come up and teach you each week, we, we teach you what God puts on our heart to teach. And so because we're going to talk about love, don't, um, don't tune out on me and think, oh, love, we know what love's all about. Uh, it's love, it's generic. I, don't, don't do that because I believe what I am sharing with you today is important. And, and I actually believe it's, it's got a, almost a prophetic kick to it this morning. So it, it's going to help you. We had a great first uh, experience. And so I believe this one's going to be better because you guys are more awesome than they are. So Ephesians chapter 3, they really needed this one in the first experience. So Ephesians chapter 3 is actually a prayer that Paul's praying for us. Verse 14, for this reason I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man. We've said this each week, but uh, I've been challenging us to start putting as much effort to the inner man as we do the outer man. You know, we can do a lot for the outside, but we need to do as much, if not more, for the man on the inside, right? So the Bible says this, that we would be strengthened in the inner man, that Christ would dwell in your hearts through faith, that you would be rooted and grounded in love. The word love here is the Greek word agape, which means the God kind of love, or God's love, which means a love without any conditions and a love of sacrifice, The Bible says be rooted and grounded in this. Whatever we're grounded in is the foundation that everything else builds on in our life. And whatever we're rooted in is is from what something grows. So the the fruit comes from the root. And so whatever you're rooted in is what's going to grow in your life. And whatever you're founded on, everything's going to build on that in your life. So the Bible says that we should be rooted and grounded in this agape love that the Bible talks about. Then it goes on and it says that we would comprehend. The word comprehend does, it means by experience, not just information. So it says that we, would be, that we would comprehend with all of the saints what is the width and the length and the depth and the height to know the love of Christ that passes all knowledge that you'd be filled with all the fullness of God. Fullness means to spill over. So the Bible says this, if we come to grasp and experience these four sides of God's love, it's going to spill over in our life. We're going to be rooted in it and grounded in it. Now look at the key. Verse 20 says, now... The word now is following all this, which means if we get rooted and grounded and understand and grasp this agape thing, look what God can do. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all we would ask or think according to the power that works in us. So there's a prerequisite for this to work in us, and that's that we have, in school they teach you, then you take a test on what you're taught. So the things that the Word's teaching us, there's a prerequisite or a test on it. And how many know the one of the toughest tests is the test of love? And so what we see here is there is, is we're going to be tested in life in this, uh, on this love thing, this agape thing. But if we're grounded and rooted in it, here's the reward of passing this love test. It's to experience the glory of God. The glory of God is the manifested presence of Jesus. So when we get rooted and grounded in this agape love, then guess what? We experience the manifest presence of Jesus. That's a pretty good payday if you ask me. So the Bible said that there are these four sides, the width, the length, the height, and the depth of God's love, or four dimensions. So a couple weeks ago, we looked at the depth of God's love, and this is what we found, that the depth of of God's love goes way down below the surface, and it meets us in our mess, and it brings us up out of our burden, and it sets our feet on a rock, and it actually puts a new song in our heart, the Bible says. And then last week we said this, if we receive that love, which is a gift, we have to respond to it. How we respond determines how high our love walk goes with God. And so that's where we've been the last few weeks. So let's go to Ephesians chapter number 5. Chapter 5, verse 1. Therefore, now I've taught you this, anytime you see the word therefore in the Bible, we have to figure out what it's there for. 
So therefore connects back to the verses above it. So we have to go back a few verses. And here's what's going on leading up to this verse. The Bible is talking about not grieving the Holy Spirit and is talking about not giving the devil a place in our life. So don't give the devil a place and don't grieve the Holy Spirit, which brings us in context to ver- chapter 4, verse 31 and 32. Then we'll get back to, to chapter 5. It says this. So Let all the bitterness, let all the wrath, let all the anger, let all the clamor, let all the evil speaking be put far from you with all its malice. And be kind to one another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God forgave you. So the Bible is telling us that the way that we grieve the Holy Spirit and the way that that we uh, um, harm the Holy Spirit and the way that we give the devil a place is, guess what? Bitterness, strife division, malice. And the Bible said, let that stuff be far from you. Now we're talking about believers here, talking to Christians. So let's go to verse five. Therefore, see how it connects all that? Therefore, look what it says, imitate God. Imitate means to mimic the actions and the attitude that God has. So therefore, get all that stuff away from you and mimic the actions and the attitude of God as dear children. Verse 2 tells us how we do that. Walk in what? Love. Walk in agape. Walk in love that is a sacrifice. Walk in love that's unconditional. As Christ also has loved us, he gave himself for us he, as an offering, as a sacrifice. The Bible said it was a sweet-smelling aroma. So the Bible tells us this. That love we're talking about, we're supposed to imitate it, mimic it, and repeat it. Have you ever noticed this, that somewhere along the line, you started to act like your parents? I mean, you fought it and fought it through all those teen years, and it just starts taking over. How many know what I'm saying? Have you ever just had one of those days, and you did like, ooh, the other day my, I did something, my wife said, you're acting just like your dad. Well, how many know sometimes that can be good, sometimes that can be bad, but we're supposed to imitate our father. It's something that happens for his children. We start imitating the father, and when we imitate the father, we're actually imitating, guess what? His love. And let me, let me, let me, let me say a, good, a couple of good things to you. You and I, as believers, we are in the family business. You know, maybe you grew up and your family had a business, and you, as you got older, you stepped into the family business. We're in the family business. You say, well, what do you mean? We're in the family business that God has. We're in the business of reconciling people, reconciling people loving people. We're in the family business. We have his name. The Bible actually says we're co-heirs. We're in partnership with God. We're in the family business here as a church, as believers. And with that family business, guess what? Comes the authority, comes the power, and comes the responsibility that goes along with that. Now, let me say this, though. The devil absolutely hates the glory of God that we share. If the glory of God is the result of this love thing, the devil absolutely hates, despises when we actually understand and walk in in this agape love. So today, we've talked about the height and we've talked about the depth of his love. I want to talk about the length of God's love today. The measurement of God, the length of God's love, which means the extent of God's love. See, God's love has no origin and God's love has no ending. Here's how I like to say it. His love is a love that goes the distance. We're going to talk about how his love goes the distance this morning. Y'all ready to go? Okay. So let's go to Hebrews chapter 10. We're going to unpack this, dissect this, make a few points, and we're going to have this a God moment at the end. Um, Now, this morning I want you to know I'm talking about love within these walls, Next week, I'm going to wrap up this series talking about love outside these walls. So I don't want anyone to leave here and say, well, he's just talking about loving each other. He's not talking about reaching the world. I'm going to talk about that next week, all right? So just hang in there. This week, we're going to talk about how love works inside these walls. Here we go. Hebrews chapter 10, verse number 22. In, this, uh, in these three or four verses, you're going to see a, a phrase that's repeated. It's the, it's the phrase, let us, which means attention. This is stuff we ought to do. So look at verse 22. Let us draw near to him with a heart in full assurance of faith. So how many know we can come near to him? That's what the Bible says. Draw near to him. Having our hearts sprinkled from evil, uh, an evil conscience, and our bodies washed with pure water. Look at verse 23. Let us hold fast the confession of, of our hope without any wavering, for he who promised is what? Faithful. Let us 
See what it's, this phrase here, let us. Now look at verse 24. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting each other so much more as you see the day approaching. How many know the day has approached? So in here, we're going to find some stuff. Now, the Bible says this, we're to walk. In other words, that means it's a lifestyle that you and I, we live this lifestyle of agape love. It ought to be an example. The church ought to be an example to the world. Just let me start right there. The church right now ought to be answering the bell. We ought to be an example to the world right now. Our world has a bunch of violence. And guess who ought to be the example like never before? The church. Now, can I divert just for a second? Let me give you a scripture that came to me in the, um, in the first experience. Because I want you to know that when I talk about love, we start thinking something. We start thinking ushy-gushy feelings. Love does create feelings, but I want to tell you what the assignment of love is. Here it is. You ready? It's in 1 John 4, 18. It says this, there is no fear in love. Perfect love will cast fear out. Because fear involves torment, he who fears has not been made perfect in love. Here is, someone needs to tweet this, write this down, do something with it. The assignment of love is to drive out fear. The assignment of love is to cast fear out. So when I say that our lifestyle needs to be agape love, the whole goal of love is not just ushy-gushy, but it's to guess what? Cast fear out. The love that should mark our lives, the love that marked the early church, it's, guess what love is there for? To drive out fear. What is the prevailing force happening in our world and our country right now? Is it not fear? How does fear get eliminated? Love. Agape love. How, you know, there is a spirit working in the world. It's a spirit of the antichrist. It's anti-Jesus. It's anti-God. And it's permeated by this thing called fear. I mean, no, fear will paralyze you. Fear will torment you. Fear will put you in terror. And the answer is the agape love of God, which should be expressed, and it should be a sign on believers. It should be a sign on our church. What will drive out fear right now is pure love. It's the love of God. Thank you for your warm amens. I mean, look at our world right now. I mean, every day there is a new report of violence. Look, there's a racism issue in our world right now. And listen to me, the answer ought to be found in the church. The Bible said we're to mimic and imitate the love of God. And guess what? You know what that means? That means that we should have the example that we're living and we're leading by. Are y'all with me? I mean, everyone's blood's the same color, right? So in the church, in this church, I can only speak for this church, but it's a God by love. This, the, the world needs to look right now and say, we are lost. Where's the answer at? It's found in the church. I'm going to have to work on you guys. So this, this love that we're going to talk about within the walls of the church with each other, I want everyone to just look around for a moment. Just look around. I told him to do this in the first experience. This is who you're doing church with. So look around. He's waving. Okay. Look, look around. There's, this is who you're doing church with. This is what I'm talking about in this room, this type of love this morning. I believe this. There are, there are these, these, these habits that help us live this lifestyle of agape love or love that goes the distance. Y'all want to know what they are? Here's the first one. The first habit is consideration. Consideration. Consideration means that you fixate on someone or something to, to a degree that you're willing to stir up love toward them or stir up some good works toward them. Let me say this to you. You don't know where everyone's been. You don't know what someone's walked through. You don't know what someone's walking through right now. You do not know why someone is behaving like they're behaving right now. The Bible said, what, what if we flip the switch? Because we are a consumer nation. We, 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 we just consume, consume, consume. But what if we, and that's what we do at church. We come to church, uh, I will, I, give me a word. I gotta have a word. It's for me, it's for me, it's for me, it's for me. What if we flip that switch and said, every time we walk in these doors, it's not about what I can gain or get. It's what I can bring and give. The Bible actually says this, that we all, every joint supplies. What that means is everybody that's in a church brings a supply. And when you don't bring your supply, we're, we're, we lack in an area. So God will bring people, he has brought people to this church, he'll bring people to this church over the next few years that bring a supply. That's why it's so important to be in the right church, to be where God sets you to be. 
but to consider, consider each other, is what the Bible is saying, that we would stir up and stimulate love toward each other, because you don't know what someone is going through. You know, here's what I've, I've, I've learned about the church. The church is one of the only organizations that shoots its wounded. Now, I believe this younger generation has a little better than the older generation, but if someone stumbles or they fall, this is what we used to do in the church world. We just gun them down. How many know that's not the grace of Jesus? But, but, but what happens when it's us? See, you want to be judged on your intention, but you want everyone else to be judged on their behavior. Well, my heart was right, brother. I like to think that, that we are the type of church that if someone struggles or they fall, even a leader or team member, that we're going the distance with them, that love goes the distance, that we don't shoot the wounded, or we don't think, well, they did this, or they're not this, or they're not that. That's, how many know that's not godly thinking? You know, I, I heard, this is one thing that people that are outside the church say, they say they don't want to go to church because the church is full of hypocrites. How many know the church is full of hypocrites? We're all hypocrites in some way, form, or the other. I'm not excusing that, but how many know there's room for one more hypocrite? How many can say in some ways I'm a hypocrite? Oh, this is the spiritual bunch. Okay, that was a, the first. But in some ways, we can be that way. But what about love that considers one another? Love that, it really means that love looks for ways to bless somebody. I had something happen in, in the last couple of weeks. I was going through something, and um, so one day I'm like, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take a power walk. So I'm walking, and you ever have a pity party for yourself? I mean, I was having one, and, I, and it was some serious stuff I was dealing with. And I was walking, I was hurt, I was disappointed, I was mad, and this is what my prayer started to be. Listen to how what my prayer started to be. I said, God, you see what's going on? My heart's hurting, da 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 And I'm like, God, I just, I need you to tell someone to call me right now. I just need to hear from somebody. I need someone to encourage me. Uh, that's how my prayer started. And it doesn't sound too bad, right? And all of a sudden, God said, I can't answer that prayer. And this is what he said. He said, you call somebody. I was wanting God to tell somebody to call me for my pity party. I thought that sounded like a good thing. And I gave him all my reasons. I'm a pastor. I'm always encouraging people. I was having a pity party. It was a serious thing. So all of a sudden, I just felt like there was a mentor of mine. I called him. Or I texted him. I said, can I call you? He said, yeah, call me. I called him. started sharing my heart. He had so much wisdom to give me. But how many times do we make it all about us? Well, I, I, was, I wasn't there for two Sundays and nobody noticed. We made it about who? Us. Well, sometimes there's a lot of people in and out. There's a lot of stuff going on. And sometimes maybe we thought you were at the beach. <laughs> if we don't know, well, I wasn't there. Well, what if we don't know? I was sick. Well, what if we don't know? No, no one's done any of this. I'm just saying. We, 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 we think, man, we just think wrong sometimes in the church. We make it about us. Well, they didn't notice. I was, I was there on the front row and I gave them, you know, my sad face. Everyone's worshiping, and everything's going good in their life. And look at me. I tried to slip my hand up. No one noticed. Don't we get that way? You know what that is? That's manipulation. And that's all about me, 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 me. Hey, if you need some help, reach out to someone and say, hey, I just need some prayer. Would you pray with me? Would you stick with me? Would you go the distance with me? But we get goofy in the church, don't we? And then we get offended. Then we get hurt. Then we're blaming this. What happened to coming to church to bring, not just to get? Yeah, I want you to come and get you a word, but I want you to come and bless somebody, encourage somebody. But everyone's coming to get encouraged. Everyone's coming to get, I, I'm, come on. We all go through stuff. But how about we build a bridge and get over that? Consideration. Here's, here's the second habit, Agreement. Agreement. The Bible says this, don't forsake assembling yourselves, what? Together. See, here, here's the deal with agreement. I, I, I want to help you with this. When I talk about agreement, I'm talking about unity, fellowship. It was a mark on the early church to be in agreement. Now, here's the deal. 
you and I can't get into true agreement unless we're in agreement with him. Here's how this should work. We get in agreement with him, it's easy to get in agreement. In other words, if the word of God says it, that we get in agreement with that, we can be in agreement. This is why I say if you're going through something, stay in agreement with the word. If you're in a relationship issue, stay in agreement with the word because you'll never be on the wrong side if you're in agreement with the word. That might mean you got to change your thoughts or your actions, but always get into agreement with what? The word of God. So we get into agreement with the word, then we can get into agreement. Otherwise, I'm trying to put my differences in agreement with you, and we're forcing them together. How many of we get in agreement with God? We can work out some racial issues. We can work out some violence issues. We can work out some problem issues. But we get in agreement with the word. It makes this unity thing easy. Are y'all doing it right? So agreement. It means I got your back. You got mine. I need you. You need me. Listen, this agreement thing, this love thing, is the outlet of grace. It is the outlet of grace. I do not believe if we do not get in agreement with God, we can truly be in agreement with each other. Because what happens when we get in agreement? The glory happens. The manifested presence of God. Now, I got something with me up here. This is a cluster of grapes. Now, the thing about this cluster of grapes, they're all connected to the same vine. They're all connected to the same source. Now, what could you do with these grapes? Well, you could take these grapes through a process, and you could make what? Wine from this. And the Bible says that wine represents what? It's a symbol of the Holy Spirit. But what if you took and you started disconnecting these grapes from the cluster? Here's what's going to happen. You're going to dry up like these raisins. See, when you get disconnected from the cluster, you're on your own, and you dry up like one of these raisins. You stay connected to this. And the Holy Spirit can do something. The presence of Jesus can do something. The glory of God can do something. So my, my, my encouragement to you is stay connected to the cluster. Stay, stay connected to the vine. Snay, snay. Stay connected to the source. Don't, don't get out here. You're going to dry up like a raisin. You know how many Christians look like these dried up raisins? They, they, they got the face. You've seen it. Well, bless God. How many of you have seen that face? How many have been to one of those churches? And Lord, have, why? They're not connected because there's, there's offense, there's division, there are these things happening. Psalm says this, how good and how pleasant when brethren dwell what? Together. The, the Bible actually says this, because you dwell together in this scripture, it says strength comes. And the Bible says this, it commands the blessing of God. When we get in agreement, guess what it does? Strength. And it demands and it commands the blessing of God. In other words, unity is what? It's a spirit thing. It is a spirit thing. Now, when, when we get in disunity, what does that mean? It means we dis the unity. And we're torn in different directions. Just like if you are disconnected from the cluster, you're torn in different directions. Now, how we know this? I've said this before. When God wants to bless you, guess what God does? He walks someone into your life to be a blessing. Guess what, God does? guess what the devil does when he wants to curse you? Walks someone into your life. You know what happens if God wants to bless an organization, if he wants to bless a church? He walks people into that church that are a blessing. If the devil wants to curse a church or an organization, what? guess what he does? He walks some people into that church. Now, there are people that become divisive. And they've got their own stories, their own opinions. And I'm going to read you something. I want you to hear this. Don't let you be one of those divisive people. Listen to this. Here's why the devil uses divisive people. Because he knows if he gets people into division, God will remove his authority and power from that person's life. And it opens them to wickedness. This can happen in a marriage, a relationship, a church, an organization, a business, if the devil can use a divisive person, then God takes his authority and power off of that person and it opens them to wickedness. That's why a lot of times you watch somebody that just got into division and you just watch their life go, <sighs> how many can think of situations like that? So this is why our job is to keep ourselves in what? Agreement. Our job is to keep ourselves in what? Unity. Don't tear yourself from the cluster. So, Consideration, agreement. Here's, here's the, last, the last habit. 
It's encouragement. The Bible says this, don't forsake assembling together. Actually, let me camp there for just a moment longer. Here's what that really means if you study that out. It means that somebody is in a church, and in this church, they start going through something in their personal life, and they start to slowly withdraw themselves. And here's why they withdraw themselves. Well, I'm going through this, and no one noticed, and no one said anything to me, and no one reached out to me. And now they build excuses, and they start withdrawing themselves. This is why Paul said in Hebrews, he said, do not forsake agreement. Do not forsake assembling together. Because if not, you'll let yourself get out of church. You'll get into mistakes, you'll fall away, and you'll fall right back into that lifestyle you were before. The Bible calls it drifting. I mean, you've come too far to let yourself drift now. And the Bible says this, as you see the day approaching, I mean, you need to be connected in church more than, in this hour that we are in, you need to be connected in church more than you ever have. Do not get casual about your church attendance. The Bible doesn't say gather, it says what? Assemble. That means you get in, get in your place, get in your part, take your spot, and let God bless you, and let God bless through you. Now, the devil will fight that. He will fight that all the way to get you in division, to get you away from, to tear you away from the cluster. When God says, get in the cluster, watch me produce something by the Holy Spirit in your life, in your church. But the third habit is this. It's the habit of encouragement. The Bible says this, exhort each other as you see the day approaching. To exhort means to encourage, and here's what it means. It means you come alongside somebody, and you get alongside them, and you say, you can do this. Now's not the time to stop believing. You got this. I'm with you. I'm going to pray you through. I'm going to stand with you. I'm, I'm, I'm going to pull for you. I'm going to pray you through. I'm going to help you work your way through. It means to come alongside Exhorting somebody, keep the faith, keep motivating them. I I wonder if someone you're around today, what if if they had a struggle? What if they had a fall? What if they had a slip back? What what if even one of the band guys or one of the leaders, no no one is, I'm just making an example. Well, how would we react? Would we say, you know what, man? True love, this agape love, this, this love that we're preaching about, This love means that I come alongside you for the long haul. I I am here to show that love goes the distance. Don't be one of those people trying to manipulate the situation. Be one of those people, hey, if you need something, go to someone and say, man, I I need someone to stick with me. need someone to, that's how this thing works. That's how this thing, the world is looking. The Bible said, as you see the day approaching, What is the world going to be looking at as we see the days approaching? Church. A few years ago, I mean, it's been a few years ago now, one of the most tragic things that happened in America was 9-11. Where did the world, where did the country look when that happened? At the church. Encouragement. That word encouragement is the same root word for the word comforter or Holy Spirit that we find in the book of John. So what the Bible says, when we come alongside and encourage, we're doing the same thing. It's the same word for the comforter that the Bible talks about being the Holy Spirit. So we're working with the Holy Spirit to what? Exhort one another, encourage one another. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 12. Beware, brethren, Anytime you see a scripture that starts out and it says, beware, brethren, guess what you better do? Beware. Lest there would be any of you that would have an evil heart of unbelief and you would depart from the living God. But look what it says in verse 13. But exhort one another daily why it is still called today. Lest any of you would have a hardened heart through the deceitfulness of sin encourage each other while it is still today. It actually says encourage each other what? Daily. I mean, what, what if you and I just took it upon ourselves to say, you know what? I'm going to encourage one person every day. Now, some of you, my wife is awesome at this. Some of you probably got a text from her or, or, or a line from her or a tweet or something, and, and it's, it's so encouraging. So she does, she does awesome at this. 
but to encourage, to come along somebody and say, have a blessed day, praying for you. You are on my heart. Anything I can pray for. What if we would be more intentional about that instead of just waiting for someone to notice our situation? The Bible says encourage, exhort, come alongside. It says to do it on a daily basis. Look at verse 14. For we have become partakers of Christ if, if. See, the word if is what? It's conditional. How do we know we become partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end? If love goes the distance, if we can go the distance, if that love goes the distance, then we know what? We have confidence from the beginning, steadfast to the end. So when we talk about the love of God, the depth of God's love reached down and it met us in the mess that we were in, the mess of our attitude, the mess of our sin, and it met us in that mess. It it brought us out of that burden, put a new song in our heart put our feet on a rock, established a new direction in our life. It met us in our mess of unbelief, bad attitude, hopelessness, hurt, accusation. The love of God met us there. Free gift, we receive it. How high that love takes us depends on how we respond to that love. And how long that love goes, the extent of that love That love can go the distance when we mimic that love. In other words, this is what I believe. You cannot really love somebody unless you've received the love of God that can wash away your past, change your thinking, change your attitude, and actually take a person with the hardest of hearts, the most hurt in a heart, and and, and expand their capacity to love somebody. And I'm not talking about love outside the walls this morning. I'm talking about what about in here? Would you be willing to let love go the distance with us? Would you? So here's my challenge to you. Let's all stand. Here's my challenge. The Bible says this. Let us consider one another. That's the opposite of let me consider me. That's the opposite of that. What that means is Look for ways to stimulate love towards someone. Now, especially if you've been in this church for a while, if, you're, if you've been walking with Jesus for, for a little bit longer than someone else, this is something you and I should master. When a guest walks in, a new person walks in, or someone you just don't know, guess what? Consider them. What, what if you walked in on a Sunday morning and just said, God, who, who might I need to bless this morning? I mean, who is it there that, that I might need to, to really bless this morning? Consider it an agreement. What if you and I really, really got into agreement with God and we got into agreement with each other? Do you know how dangerous a church would be to the power of the devil in a community? Let me let you in on this. Um, statistically, this is what they say. This is why a lot of people don't want to be in church. Statistically, they say because they know everything the church is against, but they cannot figure out what the church is for. Did y'all hear that? They know everything the church is against, but they cannot figure out what the church is for. How about we get in agreement that we're for Jesus and, and, and we're for helping hurting people, and we're for, we're for each other. And, and, and what if we got an agreement, and what if we took it to the next level and said, God, I, I'm here, speak through me, let me be an encourager, let me be an encouragement to somebody. What, what if that was our heart? What if that was our intention? Now, I do not believe you can do that, and I do not believe I can do that on our own. It takes the love of God stirring our heart. How many would, would say yes to this? How many have noticed the more you surrender to God, the more you get into his word, the more he's touched your life, have you just found an extra level of compassion that works in you? Have you ever just been somewhere 
and God says, do this for somebody, and you're like, I wouldn't have done that two years ago. Maybe you were a little more polite. <laughs> Maybe you were a little more patient. Maybe just God stirred your heart to a degree that you were like, man, God just draw me to that person. That's called the compassion of Jesus. And that's what we're talking about.